Welcome back. We just finished talking about hunger motivation and sexual motivation. These were two really detailed biological areas of motivation. We're now going to move into some smaller areas of psychological motivation that goes a little bit quicker. We're going to talk about self-determination theory as proposed by Dietschy and Ryan. So this psychological theory is the theory behind what motivates us intrinsically. Without thinking about rewards or punishments, what actually makes us do things for doing things in and of themselves? And so this is the theory that innately we are all from birth driven towards three components, autonomy, competency, and relatedness. And this holy triforce really strives us to do amazing things like mountain climbing or poetry, or even things like just wanting to play a board game with others. DJ Ryan's theory has been used in educational psychology for explaining how to motivate students more in class. So let's talk about each of these three components. Autonomy is the idea that you have freedom, you have control over yourself, and you can do things of your own volition, that you're not doing things because other people told you to. You think about in the workplace, it would be terrible if a manager came up to you and said, oh, thank goodness you're finally doing that. It would make you not want to do that anymore. And sometimes we have this desire to not do things that we would have done just because somebody told us to do them in a not so nice and autonomy supportive way. So autonomy is really the freedom to choose what you're doing. And we start to show this huge drive for autonomy as young as age two. Competence is the idea that you feel competent in doing things. This could be really intense cognitive tasks or really intense physical tasks or just everyday things. From early childhood on, kids desire to feel competent in getting dressed and tying their shoes and putting their toys away. They want to feel like they can do it. And relatedness is the idea that through doing a behavior, you're going to feel connected to others or to the universe or to an important issue. So it's the idea of what motivates you to play a board game is you want to feel connected or what might motivate you in school is if you feel more connected to your classmates or your teachers, or you're going to do this huge event for charity because you want to feel connected to others and you want to see the benefit. Self-determination theory has really helped us in shaping behaviors of others through identifying how a task could fulfill these needs and these motivations for autonomy, competence, and relatedness in a myriad of different ways. So if you think about what makes you do something that you don't necessarily get paid for, or you don't get a reward for, is it making you feel like you are accomplished? Is it making you feel like you're connected to other people or to the universe or to a greater sense of being? Or does it make you feel like you have freedom and you have control and you're amazing and you did this all on your own? Chances are these are the wheels behind the motion. Now, although everybody's born with a sense of autonomy, competence, and relatedness, all three of these things can grow into larger motivations for some of us. For instance, if your motivation for autonomy grows large enough, you no longer just want to have control over yourself and freedom over yourself, but you may actually have what we call power motivation. Power motivation is the idea that now you're not just about influencing yourself, but now you want to influence others. So power as defined in motivational psychology is power over others. And this can be used for good or evil. For instance, civil disobedience. We know things like Martin Luther King, really into power motivation, protesters, activists, people who want to influence other people for the greater good. Even parents and teachers display a certain amount of power motivation because they want to influence their students and their kids and they want to shape them and shape how they view the world. This can also be, of course, for evil, people that are dictators or tyrants or people who are just wanting to overrule others for the sake of overruling them. And so power motivation can be very diverse. Whether it's for benevolent or malevolent reasons, power motivation makes someone want to be inspirational. They want people to look up to them and admire them. In the case of social media, this may be someone who desires a lot of followers and a lot of likes and a lot of attention. And just by the nature, an influencer is someone who has a high power motivation because they want to influence others. Now, people high in power motivation are not so interested in how well they did a task, but they want to be perceived as number one. So it's not actually, did they do the grunt work and did they do it competently, but more, do they get the attention and respect for doing it? Sometimes power motivation can go really too extreme and really wrong. And this is when we can lead into things like power saturation. 
So if we get too attentive to climbing the ladder and always trying to get more and more and more, power saturation is when this is all we become focused on, that we don't really tend to other parts of our life. We stop trying to look on relationship maintenance or health maintenance, and we're so consumed by our desire for power. This is actually linked with a low level of success. In a study in which five individuals sat around a table and attempt to solve problems, some of the tables had an individual who scored very high in power saturation, and some tables did not. And all the tables were given the same series of problem solving tasks. What they found is the task required everyone to, to work together, to share their perspectives, and five minds together are better than one. And so the tables that didn't have someone high in power saturation could all work together, could all cooperate and delegate, and were able to solve more problems. But the tables that had one individual high in power saturation actually didn't solve the problems as well. The person high in the power saturation would do all the talking, they wouldn't listen to the other four people's perspectives, and they were more obsessed with the other four people hearing them out and dominating over them than they were in solving the problems. So because of that, they worked less efficiently. So because of this, we know power saturation is more about just seeming prestigious rather than having the substance to back up the flash. And so people high in power saturation tend to not do so well in the relationships. Power saturation is associated with lots of zero relationships and lots of divorces, also associated with lots of health risks. There could be a lot of substance use and substance abuse, particularly alcoholism. In addition, things like blood pressure and heart attacks tend to be high and elevated in individuals with power saturation. Finally, people with power saturation tend to show high levels of aggression. Both physical and sexual violence tend to be more likely to occur in people with power saturation. So while our desire for autonomy is good, and while a moderate level of power motivation is good in things like teachers and parents and community leaders, it's important to understand that power saturation is really taking it too far. In addition, if we think about our desire for relatedness, some of us, our desire for relatedness grows into a larger motivation for intimacy. Our desire for intimacy is not the same as extroverts who want to have lots of friends or lots of contacts. Instead, intimacy isn't about the quantity of friends, but the quality of our relationships. People high in intimacy spend a lot of their time thinking about their relationships and not ruminating or obsessing over them, but more so wondering how people are doing. People high in intimacy motivation are more likely to send that postcard or send a letter or just start a text message chain out of the blue to see how you're doing after not talking for a little while. They're the ones more likely to reach out and just genuinely care. And when they are interacting with other people face to face, they display a lot of positive emotions. They're the ones that when you sit down to have coffee with each other, they are glowing and they're just so happy to see you and being with them lights up your day. As you're conversing with someone high in intimacy motivation, they smile, they laugh, they make more eye contact, they are great listeners, and they just make you feel supported. They're also more likely to self-disclose when they're talking to you. They're gonna be vulnerable. They'll put their heart on their sleeve and really open up, and they allow you to have a space to open up as well. So in people high in intimacy motivation, this tends to be tied with lots of really good things. And the higher one is in intimacy motivation, the better off they seem. In fact, high intimacy motivation tends to be linked with lots of indices of well-adjustment and well-being. People higher in this motivation use less substances, they cope with stress more, and they have more enduring relationships over the lifespan. So if you think of someone who's low in intimacy motivation, that'd be someone who doesn't bother reaching out, and when you finally get together, they are such a downer, and they're always complaining and talking negatively. They can't really prioritize the relationships because they have a lot to go on their own. When they're talking, they're always preoccupied on their phone, or they're distracted. You don't really feel connected to them. And they tend to be more likely to use substances to not have enduring relationships and to not deal with their stress so well. So intimacy motivation, by and large, seems to be a really good thing, but in modern society, we tend to not prioritize it as much as we should. And finally, for this segment, when our desire for competency grows, it can grow into a larger achievement motivation. And so achievement motivation can take lots of different forms, but overall, our desire for achievement is our desire to meet a certain standard of excellence. And these standards of excellence might be based on just completing a task, they might be based on competing against yourself and your prior efforts, or they might be based on competing with others. Let's take running, for example. Maybe you just want to run a marathon to say that you've run a marathon, and you don't care about how you do in the race or, or how other people want you to do. You just want to be able to say you did it. 
Or maybe you're more interested in running a marathon and beating your previous time. Or maybe you want to run a marathon and come in the top 10% and maybe be a medal winner. So those would be different types of standards of excellence. We can think of someone who just wants to cook a delicious meal for having a delicious meal. Or maybe they want to cook a meal better than they did last time. Or maybe they want to cook better than anyone they know and show someone up that they can cook better than them. Different levels of standard of excellence would still fit in this achievement motivation. Now what's really interesting is individuals with a really high level of achievement motivation, what we find is they don't desire the hardest of tasks, they actually desire a moderate level of challenge. Meaning they actually want a challenge they think they can finish. So they don't like taking things on that are too easy, and they don't like taking things on that are too hard. They look for things right in that Goldilocks zone that they think they're achievable for their skill set. They also really desire a lot of feedback. They want to know what the expectations are, and when they finish the task, they want to know that they did it well. And finally, they really desire tasks that can be their own personal responsibility. This means individuals high in achievement motivation do not like group work. Group work can be really frustrating to individuals who are high in achievement motivation. Now, when it comes to things like relatedness and intimacy or autonomy and power or competency and achievement, it's important to point out there are some gender differences here. We know that historically it's been harder for women to display high power motivation because even a moderate level of power motivation often gets women heavily criticized in public. We also know that it's harder for men to display a high intimacy motivation. That is starting to gradually change, but we know that historically it's been harder for men to really show this softer side and this prioritization of this emotional and psychological intimacy. And one final thing, it's possible to have lots of combinations of these motivations. You could have high power, high achievement, and high intimacy motivation, or low in all three, or in many different types of levels amongst them. So they're all considered to be pretty independent with one another.